and welcome. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to to wrap things up and tie them with a bow a little bit tonight. So um, our goal uh, tonight um, are the. I titled this section a look, a look at what the Gospels teach, and that's probably not a great title <laughs> because if we really took a look at what the Gospels teach, uh, we could easily go another six weeks on this course, uh, quite easily. What we're going to be focusing on tonight are, are some very, very core things like the nature of God as, as taught in the Gospels. Jesus Christ... Who is he? How does he relate to the Father? And then the Holy Spirit. How do those three relate to one another in the way they minister to us and in the way, that, and in the way they're at work in this world? And then, uh, and then we've been looking at a few other things like tips on how to interpret parables, a little bit on the, uh, some of the, we'll, we'll take a brief look at the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and then a few other things before we're done tonight. So, Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, these weeks that we've had. And I pray tonight as we, um, as we have this final session that you would give us grace to better love you as a result of, as a result of lear learning a little bit more about you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start out identity of Christ as found in the Gospels. And so uh, I, if I could get some volunteer readers here, uh, can anybody get Isaiah 61, the first three verses? Volunteer, Isaiah 61. All right. Thank you, Holly. And then Daniel 7. Daniel 7, and we'll go 13 and 14. Who can get? All right. Thanks, Kenny. And then John 5, 17 to 18. Who can get that one? Thank you, Brad. And then John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Who can get? All right. Thanks, Brenda. So identity of Christ, and we're focusing it here on names of Christ. What Jesus Christ calls himself or how he's referred to in the Gospels. And this first one we're looking at is anointed one. Um, so... Let's see, who, who is taking Isaiah 61, verses 1, 2, and 3 for us? Thanks, Holly, if you could read that. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of famine. Thank you. Famine. I can't say that. Mine says faint spirit, so maybe it's a fainting. I don't have glasses on. It's okay. <laughs> I'm dependent on those two. Of the Lord that he may be glorified. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, because the Lord has anointed me. Uh, you might notice there on this slide, Luke 4 18, Jesus, when Jesus uh, was visiting his hometown of Nazareth, it was on a Sabbath day, he read this passage from, from the scriptures. Um, anointed one, uh, the Greek word. Christ or Christos means anointed one. So every time you say Jesus Christ or every time you see Jesus Christ, it means Jesus anointed one. And this is, this is where that's grounded. This is where the whole concept of Christ really, I think it's fair to say, is grounded right here in Isaiah 61. Christ is God's anointed one. What does that mean? He's come to bring good news. He's come to set captives free. He's come to bring hope. He's come to bring joy. He's come to pronounce judgment, but he's also come to pronounce the coming of the kingdom of God. God's um, you know, anointing in, in Old Testament terms, that was done with kings. 
uh, setting apart leaders to lead, or in the case of priests, setting, about, setting apart them to lead. And this is Jesus Christ set apart by God the Father to accomplish these things. So that's one key title for Jesus Christ. And then, uh, whoops. Yeah. So, I have to say something about that. Yeah. The, um, Hebrews have their certain scriptures they read every set, the scrolls they bring in they read. That was the that was the point of the scroll that was read. That was the point in time of the scroll that was read. So he read that and then he said, I, I'm the fulfillment of that. Yeah. It was, it was the um, Point time to read that point yeah, yeah, on that Sabbath day, it was it was a regular reading that was to be done on that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anointed one, also now son of man. Who's got Daniel for us? Daniel seven thirteen. Yeah, thirteen and fourteen. If you want to do that too. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man. Okay, so this is in Daniel 7, this is one of, one of several visions that Daniel gets during, during this time. And uh, this particular one is one, it's a vision of, of history that leads up to the end. There are uh, four creatures in it. One emerges from the great sea is a, is a lion which represents Babylon. Another one emerges and that's, that's a ram which represents the Persian Empire. Then I think there's a goat that comes out that represents Alexander the Great's empire. And then is it a goat? I got my wrong creatures. I think it is. It's a critter anyhow. And, uh, and then comes this other indescribably horrible beast that represents uh, leadership in the, in the last days. And so um, all of this kind of comes to a, um, a crescendo. The beast is killed. Verse 11, its body is destroyed. Uh, the dominion, the dominion of beasts, in other words, the d dominion of humanity that has set up itself in opposition to God comes to an end. And then this is when Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, behold, in the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days. Ancient of days is probably a reference to God the Father. And so here's this one that's like a son of man. In other words, he's human in appearance. And, he is, and yet he's given all the authority of God. He's given a, a kingdom that will never end. Um, everyone will bow down to him. He will rule with, with an unlimited rule. And so, as you notice up there, this is, I think, Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself. Forty separate times. I mean, that's even counting parallels. It's 40 actual separate times where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. He'll say, the Son of Man will this, the Son of Man will that. Uh, he, he seemed to be particularly fond of this way of referring to himself. And maybe it's because, one, uh, you see from this prophecy of Daniel, this, this conquering Lord, you know, he, the one that Ephesians 2 is, or Philipp, excuse me, Philippians 2 is talking about, uh, before whom every knee will bow and tongue confess. He's Lord, and yet at, at the same time when he calls himself Son of Man, not only is he identifying himself as Lord, but he also identifies himself with us. Because this, this eternal Lord is also human. And so... Uh, it, it, it's a great way of kind of merging the, the identity of Christ, God, fully God and, and fully human at the same time. So Son of Man is a, apparently maybe his favorite way of referring to himself. And then, of course, uh, Son of God. Let's see, who had, uh, who had John 5, 17 and 18 for us? Thanks, Brad. Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day. And I 
Jews cry at all For this reason, the Jews cry at all hearts to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Okay, so as you see up there, uh, Son of God, uh, that occurs about 20 times in reference to Jesus Christ. So again, a very common way that Jesus refers to himself or that he's referred to by the gospel writers. This is a conversation, we looked at this before, I think, where um, Jesus healed a, a man who was lame by the pool. He was accused of healing him on the Sabbath. Um, and this was in Jerusalem, so this, the Sanhedrin got word of it, and there was kind of this inquisition of Jesus at that time. And uh, Jesus ex is explaining here that he's, he says he's the Son of God, and that got the Sanhedrin very angry with him because claiming to be Son of God he, he is, is equal to him saying that he's equal with God. Son and Father are are of the same nature. And so, um, let's look at one more. The Word, of course, familiar. We've looked at this once or twice already. Who had John 1 for us? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Thank you. So, the word, uh, of course, John's the only one who refers to him this way, but this is really important, isn't it? Because we learn from John explaining, call, where he's talking about him as the word, he was with God, he was God, and he created everything. Everything was made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Everything came through him. And he's also light. And we come to understand, we'll see this a little bit later in the Gospel of John. You know, ancient people understood this just as well as we do. They, did, they didn't know the mechanism the way we do, the way light is converted by plants into energy and food. But they understood just as well as we do that light, light is life. Nothing, nothing much grows in the shadows. And so calling him light in this context, he's creator of all things. He's also the, the giver of life. He's the one who gives us life. And we'll see more about what, how John has to say about this. So those are four really important titles of Jesus Christ that you see. Uh, in the Gospels, um, anointed one, or Christ, uh, son of man, son of God, word, meaning creator, uh, and, and our life. Any, any questions before we move on from that? All right. Um, let's talk a little bit now, just moving on in John, about eternal life. The Gospel of John, John is the, he's the apostle of eternal life. I mean, he talks more about eternal life than anybody else does. Um, the Gospel of John is saturated with Jesus talking about eternal life, or, or John talking about Jesus being the source of eternal life. And of course, Let's just take a look at John chapter 3, because this is, this is really a very, very important text about that. Remember, um, even before Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, way back at the start of things, Jesus went down to Jerusalem during the Passover. And one of the things that happened there, he'd been doing some teaching and miracles in Jerusalem, and Nicodemus, a Pharisee, was very curious about him. And, uh, and so you see Nicodemus coming to him in, at night. Uh, John 3, 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these things that you do unless God is, is with him. So what did Jesus say? Oh, thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks for, no, he didn't say that. He says, verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? I mean, birth is one of those things that we have absolutely no control of, right? The mom doesn't have any control of it. But, I mean, the baby even less than none. <laughs> I mean, birth is something that happens to us, right? We cannot cause that to happen. It occurs to us. And so I think we got to say that one of the things that Jesus is getting across to this man, Nicodemus, who spent his whole adult life up until now trying to get close to God through works of the law, through developing, developing his knowledge of God. And uh, here Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, in order for you to know God, something needs to happen to you that you have zero control over. And, and of course, the other aspect of, of being born is that it's, it's, not, it's not you 2.0 that we're talking about. It's, it's, not, it's not you or me with some tweaks, some upgrades. <laughs> it's a whole new you that needs to be. And of course, Nicodemus is thrown by this. Um, Nicodemus asks almost maybe a bit sarcastically, how can an old guy like, my, like me go back inside and be born again? Um, this completely throws Nicodemus, but, but Jesus goes on. Verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he gotta, cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, what does he mean by water and spirit? Just real quickly, here's my best thing on what it, there's lots of theories, what Jesus means by born of water and born of the spirit. Here's my best guess opinion on that. Um, if you go back to John, what's he doing? He's baptizing with water. What's John's baptism of water about? It's about repentance from sin. And, and I think Jesus reference and, and Nicodemus would have been very familiar with John's ministry too. He no doubt tracked what John the Baptist was doing. And so I, I, I think that his reference to water there has to do, it's a, it's a reference back to the ministry of John and the importance of repentance in this. But, but repentance, acknowledgement of sin, but then there's this thing that has to happen to you that you have no control over. And that's, uh, and that's to be a given life through the Spirit, by water and the Spirit. And uh, he goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I've said to you, you must be born again. And then he uses this illustration, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, you know, we had a, a major change in wind direction, right? For days, the wind's been blowing out of the south. And we've been getting these lovely uh, warm weather. And guess what happened today, right? That you know, We had rain coming sideways from the west today. Did we have any control over that at all? No. <laughs> None. Zero. And I think that's the core of Jesus' point with Nicodemus is Nicodemus... You know, again, here's this man who's tried his whole life to try to get to know God by doing this, that, and the other thing. Nose bent in the Torah all the time. And uh, Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you need a life change. And you can't get this life change by doing anything, any more than you can control the wind. And so... You know, it drills down to these famous words, right? What is it then? How does one get this eternal life? How does one, how is one, a person reborn by the Spirit? What, what needs to happen? Uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, but have eternal life. So that's the message. I mean, it's, a lot of times people talk about the book of Romans as being such a thorough treatment of 
salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that's very, very true. Romans lays this out very thoroughly, but I think the Gospel of John does it just as thoroughly, just in a different way. Uh, we cannot do this salvation thing. We cannot conjure it up. We cannot save ourselves any more than we can control the wind. We need to be reborn. And that comes through faith in Christ, not by works. Um, and so that's the message that you get. And, and uh, again, 17 individual times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking about eternal life. He brings it up over and over and over again in conversation after conversation with the woman at the well, with the, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and over and over again. He talks about eternal life. It's like he, he just keeps it out there in front of people. And uh, um, even, you know, really down to the very end, you get to Jesus' uh, prayer that he prays just as he and the disciples are just about to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and he says, he prays to God. Um, he lifted up his eyes. This is uh, John 17, middle of verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority all, all, over all flesh to give eternal life to those whom you have given. And this is eternal life, that they know you, and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is not fire insurance. Eternal life is not merely not going to hell. Eternal life is knowing God. And uh, you know, probably one of the wisest ways I've heard heaven described is that the key thing to heaven is God's there. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, what is John 5, 3, I think it is, says, um, we do not yet know what we shall be, but we know that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Um, eternal life is to know God for eternity. Any, any thoughts, questions, reflections on that before we, before we move on? So, again, our, our friend John is the one who really has so much to say about eternal life. Now a little bit on the Holy Spirit. Um, let me just back up and background this a little bit. One other thing that is emphasized, that Jesus emphasizes in the Gospel of John over and over and over again is that he gets his direction from the Father. He does, not do, he does exactly what the Father tells him to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, if we go back to that familiar spot of John 5, where uh, they're doing this inquisition on him. Um, after, he heals the, uh, after he heals the lame man by the pool, John 5, 19. So Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees his father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. And so Jesus is, this is not the only conversation. I think this comes up two or three other times in the Gospel of John where, where he's being questioned by the Sanhedrin and he, and he makes it very, very clear. He gets his directions from God the Father. And, and he's not... He's not operating outside that at all. Again, this is God the Son. He's subordinate to the Father. Both are part of the Trinity. Both are God fully in nature. And yet God the Father has this authority over the Son while he's here on earth. And the Son is going to do exactly what God the Father tells him to do and nothing else. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of a mediator in all of this. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Um, and you see, uh, one of the places where you see this beautifully and profoundly is now in the Gospel of Luke. 
Because when you look at the life of Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Luke, some, some very interesting kinds of things unfold in terms of how, how the Holy Spirit is working in Jesus' life and directing him and empowering to do what God the Father has called him to do. So the whole Trinity is working together in this. And so, you know, you can see uh, as we just go down through these verses here. Oops, went too far. Luke 1, 30, 35. Gabriel says to Mary that the one that was, is to be conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will surround you, engulf you, the angel says. So you have the Holy Spirit in power from the very get-go. Jesus is conceived as a work of the Holy Spirit. And then um, you go on into John 3.20, or excuse me, Luke 3.21 and 22, where um, Jesus is then baptized. And again, you see this glorious picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together. And the Holy Spirit comes down upon Jesus Christ. And this is kind of, this is maybe, I don't want to get too goofy here or crazy, but, you know, this is probably part of his anointing process where the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus Christ. This is very important for us to see. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. And then in the, in the same time, God the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus Christ. And then as you read through Luke, from that moment on, the Holy Spirit is guiding, empowering, directing uh, as soon as Jesus is baptized, he goes out. It's under the leadership of the Holy Spirit that he goes out into the wilderness where he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then it's under the leadership and power of the Holy Spirit that he comes back now after that time to, to minister in Galilee. And so the Holy Spirit is, is directing this whole thing with Jesus Christ. And... Um, and empowering it. I, uh, Matthew 12, 28 um, says this. In Matthew 12, 27 and 28, um, the, the Sanhedrin is accusing Jesus Christ of, of, uh, of expelling demons, demons from people with the power of the devil. Beelzebul. But Jesus says this, if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus is saying, the Spirit of God is, is the power by whom I'm, I'm expelling demons. And this very Holy Spirit power that you're seeing is evidence that the kingdom of God is here. So the Holy Spirit, he's, he's with Jesus from conception and he's guiding him and he's empowering him. And then uh, I know we're going outside the Gospels, but, but Romans in, uh, in its explanation of, of the resurrection, if you go to Romans 8.11, it's talking to us and it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And we could talk a long time about that, but the point to, to note there is that it was the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. So the Holy Spirit is there really from all the way through, from, from Jesus' conception to his resurrection and every time in between. And it's an amazing thing to think how it seems that Jesus in the way that he emptied himself, you know, in Philippians 2 it says he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And it, Jesus didn't have to do this because he's God by nature, but Jesus chose to live his life in submission to the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Holy Spirit was operating in submission to the Father 
But Jesus lived his life the same way we need to. In submission to the Holy Spirit. Again, it seems to me he didn't have to do that. But he intentionally did. And as you, as you track it out in Luke, of course, Luke's the author of the book of Acts. And it isn't, isn't it interesting how Luke takes these pains to show that it was through the direction and power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus did what he did. And then where, where do you, what do you get in the book of Acts? You see the church doing what the church does in the direction and the power of the Holy Spirit. So it just things just kind of keep rolling. So, um, so that's, that's the Holy Spirit from what we learn, kind of a very quick summary from what we learn in Luke. But then you learn about the Holy Spirit in John. And it's amazing you put Luke and John together, what, what you are able to learn about who the Holy Spirit is and, and what the Holy Spirit does. Um, now, um, John 3, we just read that, where Jesus told Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And this is something that the Holy Spirit does in you when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and then uh, John 4, that's uh, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. And how the Holy Spirit is like water that comes up, that refreshes, that renews us from the inside out. And so that's some of the work that the Holy Spirit does that you see talked about in John. And then uh, if we can get some more helpers here, who can help us out in John 14? And this would be verses 15 through 18. Who can do? All right. Thank you, Steve. And then also out of John 14... Verses 25 and 26. Who can get... All right. Thank you, Rick. And then uh, someone then who can get John 16 for us. 16 verses 8 through 11. You can get those. Thank you. So, um, all of this teaching that we're getting here out of John 14, 15, 16, all of this is coming as Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples. Incredible, amazing teaching that Jesus is doing on that last night with his disciples about what's coming. Here's what life is going to be like, guys. It's going to be tough, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You've got hope. There's a, I'm preparing a place for you, but there's work to do. But here's the good part of that. There's someone who is here to help you in that work. Someone here to guide you. Someone here to empower you. And so uh, let's, let's take a look. Who, let's see, who was it has John 14, 15 through 18? Steve, thanks. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay. So, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, looking at maybe a series after the first that deals with this a little bit. But, but God, God's love language is for us to take his word seriously and follow it. That's that's principal way that we love him back. So Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. But you know what? <laughs> you need help with that. <laughs> so I'm sending you a helper. I'm sending you a counselor. I'm sem sending you someone who can support you in this walk of obedience. And so that's one key role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to Help us see when we've messed up. And the Holy Spirit may, may work through a friend, a brother, a sister who, who shows us something in our lives or, or maybe something just reading in the Word of God or any number of ways where, where the, the Holy Spirit speaks into our conscience. And, and Okay, that's not right, is it? I need to go to God for, and confess that and, and see Him work in my life through that. Um, and, and not just not just confession, but also just guidance in 
how we make the Word of God practical. How do I live this out? Little decisions and big ones every day. Um, and so the Holy Spirit is here to help us with that. Um, also, let's see, who had John 14, 25, and 26? Thanks, Rick. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Thank you. So, similar to what we just said, one of the ways the Holy Spirit works is, is he is able to recall truth to our minds. I mean, if you're one of the disciples, you can see why this would be a little bit like, wait a second, you're going away. What are we going to do? You know, and, and Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit's with you. And, and he, will, he will recall to your mind these things that you've been taught. So you don't have to, you don't have to uh, live and worry that, that you're not sufficient to do what you've been called to do. The Holy Spirit is there. And maybe you've had this experience you've, where someone's sharing a, a struggle with you or, and, and, and the Lord gives you the things to say. He kind of prompts your mind. You know, and, and so he, he recalls to our minds the, the truth that he's, that he's loaded in there. Um, let's look at John 16, starting in verse 8. John 16, 8 through 11. Who had that for us? Thanks, Kathy. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and he will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So, not only is the Holy Spirit here to help us, guide us in our lives personally, but the Holy Spirit's out there. The Holy Spirit is out there at work. So that, you know, Paul, when he, when he asked for people to pray for him, he said, pray for open doors. Why would he ask for open doors? Because there's doors being opened out there. <laughs> and, and Paul needs to find those. The Holy Spirit is out there helping people to understand they need Christ. Um, we would be, you know, in terms of talking to the world about the gospel, we'd be flapping our jaws for no reason if it were not for the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work out there in our world. And so he's in us, guiding us, but he's also out there. And that's, a, that's an encouraging thing to think about if, you're, if you have a relative or a neighbor or, or work colleague that you're... you're wanting to see come to faith in Christ, you can pray for that the Holy Spirit would open a door. Just open a door that would be an opportunity for me to, to somehow help this person. Um, somehow, either by telling my own story or, um, or, or relating the gospel to this person, that God would open the door for that to happen. So he's out there and he's... he's, he's uh, absolutely committed to, to be in the business of leading people to faith in Christ. So, um, the Gospels um, are a very, very important place to go to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he's really up to. Uh, the letters, you know, there's five places in the letters that talk about gifts of the Holy Spirit and that's helpful, that's important to know. Um, but really when you want to get down to the nitty gritty of who is the Holy Spirit and what is he really up to in this world, boy, the Gospels are a very, very rich place to go. Luke, you see it just in the narrative of how the Holy Spirit is doing things. John in the form of Jesus just teaching on who the Holy Spirit is and, and what he does. Um, any, any questions on that before we move on? All righty, well, we'll move on. Um, Sermon on the Mount, um, you know, we could spend a week on that, couldn't we? 
Um, but um, you know, here's here's the interesting attribute of the Gospel of Matthew, where we've just seen how, the beauty of how Luke teaches us certain things. And I think this is true of Mark too, kind of along the way through the narrative of what's happening. And John is so powerfully theological, so powerfully this is how you get to know God. And this is who Jesus is. And this is who the Holy Spirit is. And you get this rich, amazing theology from John. With Matthew, you get this, this amazing, just just practical bare knuckles discipleship and what is what does a disciple look like you know let's get practical here I think Mark Matthew would say what does this look like what what do you what do you what are you doing and what are you not doing if you're a follower of Jesus Christ um, and the Sermon on the Mount of course is is the the great kind of treatise on that uh, Matthew 5 through 7 and uh, we don't have time to go through all of it, but, but even if you just look at how it opens up, um, Matthew 5 and verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I, I hope that if anybody has ever told a lie about you uh, because you happen to be a follower of Christ, um, I, I, hope, I hope you find comfort in those words. But just all those, it, beautiful, isn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are those who know they're not the full package. <laughs> Bless, blessed are those who know they ain't good enough. Uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed over the things. Blessed are those who mourn over the things that God mourns. They will be comforted. Um, blessed are the meek. Not those who who push ahead in the in the in the uh, line, but those who consider others better than themselves. Philippians chapter two. They, those, will inherit the earth. Those who desire right, hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied, and on and on. What is he talking about here? Jesus is, is giving a, a profile of what a disciple looks like. Now, when you read this profile, you realize, um, if this is up to me, myself, but for the grace of God, that, that dog just isn't going to hunt. Uh, I... I I'm completely dependent on God's grace in order for anything in this Matthew 5, 6, 7 profile to be, to be realized in me. But, but this is where Jesus kind of lays out practical terms. What does a disciple look like in terms of our daily decisions, in terms of how we treat people, how we pray, how we get things done in life, how, how we deal with the ups and downs in life and the things that would cause anxiety. Um, Here's what it looks like. And, and so J Jesus talks about um, what to do about anger, lust, marriage, um, forgiveness, loving our enemies, generosity, giving to the needy, prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I'm just going through t titles here. Um, uh, more on generosity, overcoming anxiety, not being judgmental, asking for things as we pray, and, and on and on. Just incredible, amazing, practical, here's what being a disciple looks like. 
And, uh, but we should be really grateful for Matthew, <laughs> that, uh, that he, he presents the teachings of Jesus. And, and we're able to see not only the Gospel of John and these great glorious things about who Jesus is, and, and, uh, but, but the, we, see, we see in Matthew, okay, disciples, here's, here's what this looks like, folks. Here's what I'm calling you to do. Um, and so, anybody, I mean, uh, there's no way in a few minutes we can give justice to the Sermon on the Mount, but any, any thoughts, questions, observations as you're looking through it? Question. It says that, that uh, the disciples came to him, so, so these were followers, and they were the disciples, so there were 12 disciples, so they kind of followed him in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I think, you know, disciples would, a disciple is someone who, who believes, he doesn't, he or she doesn't fully know who it is they believe in yet, or what he's going to do. But there is, there is a, a level of trust there, a, little faith, a level of faith there. And, uh, you know, in, there, there are times when Jesus taught in very, here's what a disciple looks like kinds of ways. And there are times when he really dialed in on eternal life. And Matthew gives us the window into Jesus' teaching where he's, He's teaching them, okay, this is what a disciple looks like. Now, he's not teaching legalism. I think that's very important for us to understand. He's not teaching behave in these ways and then you'll merit something. He's talking about, though, what a, what a grace-filled person's life looks like. And I guess for those who are listening to this who, who didn't quite understand yet or didn't at all understand what Jesus was going to do, is that this drew them. I want my life to be like that. How does that happen? And, and it drew people, I, I believe, to Christ and wanting to follow him and, and lean in more into, into how, how that kind of, where that kind of life comes from. All right. Parables. Let's talk a little bit about them. There's a... There's a bajillion parables in the Gospels, aren't they? But let's, let's talk a little bit about what do you do with a parable? How do you unpack a parable? Um, and so we're going to go to a classic Luke in Luke chapter 15. And uh, a few principles that were One thing with parables is that I think this is true for virtually all of them. There's one main point. Even in like uh, the parable of the sower, you know, that has so many parts and you have the different kinds of soil and how they represent different things. Even there, the, the purpose of that parable is you want to be good soil. <laughs> and here's what good soil is like. Um, the, the word of God takes root in that person's life and, it, and, and it's expressed and it's productive. Um, so I, I think it's virtually across the board. When you're reading a parable, there's going to be one main point. So the, the, the challenge is, in it is then is what is that one main point? Now the parable that we're going to be looking at um, 
what's called the parable of the prodigal son. You know, that's been sliced and diced for <laughs> since Bible times, right? And, and people will sometimes focus and dial in on, you know, various aspects of fine detail. And that, that's, that's okay uh, in the sense of, yeah, maybe we identify with the prodigal son real closely. And, and um, you know, there, there's a lot in that parable that kind of triggers our imagination a little bit. The father running to the son. But in all of that, what's the main point? What's the main takeaway to this? And so there's usually one central point. And it's also very important when you're looking at a parable to see what comes before it, to see who's the audience that Jesus is sharing this parable with. Where are these folks at? And what is he, what is he trying to get them to understand through this parable? And then notice how much space, if there are multiple characters, now some parables are extremely simple like the lost coin and those kind, but this is kind of a longer, more complex one. Um, who, gets, uh, who gets the attention, the number of lines uh, devoted to them? And so when, you, when we go through and look at the, uh, and look at the parable of the, of the prodigal son, Look back at first at um, the very start of Luke 15. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then he told them a parable. And so he tells them a number of parables, one about a lost sheep, one about a lost coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. So who's the audience that this parable is speaking to? It's speaking particularly to Pharisees and scribes who are, who are grumbling over the sinners that Jesus was willing to associate with. Okay? So you bear that in mind. You come to the parable of the prodigal son, and... Uh, we see that there's a man with two sons. The younger son said, give me the share of my property. Uh, so uh, the, the father let him take his share of the property. And he took a journey to a far country, squandered it completely. There was a severe famine where he was. He went and hired himself out because he'd wasted, squandered his money. And uh, he was, before he knew it, he was... Eating, eating pig slop, basically. Then he came to himself and realized how many of his father's, how father's hired servants have more than enough bread. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. No longer worthy. But then we read, while he was a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion, ran, um, embraced him, kissed him, and then he, he, the son confesses, but the father says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this is my son who is dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate the end. Oh, wait a second. No, there's more. In fact, there's quite a bit more. <laughs> and what's the, look through it. You familiar with this parable, or as you read through, what's the more about? The okay, the other brother. What's what's up with the other brother? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the other brother, he's 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 been busy crossing all his T's, dotting all his eyes, being being the from his perspective at least the obedient son. And uh, the party's going on, and, and, the, and the, the other brother, the one who's been good, is, is out there angry that all this attention's being given to this, this sinful brother of his. And then what happens? See, the father doesn't go out to just one son in this parable. The father pursues, he goes out, 
he leaves the party and he goes to the other brother. Do you see that? And he bids him to come on in. Because my, he, he, says, he says to his, the son who's angry, son, you've got everything. Everything I have belongs to you. It's not like that you're being shorted something. But what was lost is now found. Come on, join the party. And that's the last, what, quite a few verses um, are, are, are focused. And, and also notice it's, it's the end emphasis. A lot of times what comes at the end is, is at the heart of what Jesus is trying to get across to the people that he's speaking to. So this is called the parable of the prodigal son, but if you think about it, it could just as easily be called the parable of the resentful son or the parable of the jealous son. And it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that the end emphasis there, he's, he's actually, Jesus in a very compassionate way is reaching out to those scribes and Pharisees. And he's like saying, son, come in and join the party. This, this takes nothing away from you. These people who are lost, they're being found. Join in. Become part of it. So, I mean, just, just one example of, you know, usually there's one main point. And, and so are there, are there beautiful illustrations that, that come from from the father's interaction with the prodigal son, of course. And, um, I mean, you could make a full stop there with, with the father's rejoicing over the prodigal son and have a beautiful message, yes. But we miss quite a bit, don't we, if we stop there. Um, and realize that um, the main point, at least for those scribes and Pharisees, was... It was what, what's driven home there at the very end. So just, just kind of some, a little bit of coaching on, on reading the parables. Again, usually one point. And, and kind of notice, um, is there anything at the end that's particularly emphasized? Um, and uh, any, any other questions on parables and that sort of thing? I want to just ask you a thought real quick on this parable. My, just my off the top response would be I think I don't think we necessarily need to limit it to uh, the prodigal son is necessarily a believer before he leaves um, you know, he's a part of the family so I mean maybe you could say okay he's, he's a believer but um, you know, if you think of it from on the practical sense, a lot of us as parents, um, we raise kids to know Christ. Sooner or later, though, they have to own their own faith. And you can, you can have a prodigal who you've raised this child in, in submission to the Lord every way you know how to follow Christ. Maybe they've owned their faith, maybe they haven't, but they, they go off for at least a period of time. And, and the prayer is that either they'll find that faith that they just haven't quite grabbed onto, or they will return to that faith that they once professed. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that we need to necessarily have to limit it to the prodigal son is a believer who's now gone on a bad direction or maybe someone who wasn't a believer but was raised to be one. I, I mean, I think there are a number of life situations that the, that, that piece of the parable relates to, my thought. All right.
right. Well, we're going to wrap up with, in Luke 9, verses 23 and 25, this is something that Jesus taught a number of times as we read it here. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? You know, notice he says, take up your cross daily. Now, Jesus, he took up his cross one definitive time and died for us, everyone who had come to faith in Christ died for our sins, experienced alienation from God in our place. Um, but Jesus here says in referring to us, we take up our cross daily. In other words, there isn't just one defining moment where we take up a cross. It's, it's just kind of a daily part of who we are. And, and we talked about this, if you were here on Sunday, and if you're going to be here on Wednesday, we talk about this a little bit. Where, where love is being willing to, to uh, lay aside our convenience, lay aside our time, lay aside whatever for the sake of someone else. Or Philippians 2, considering others better than ourselves. And, and so Jesus says, take up your cross daily. And so there's just part of being a disciple is us, you and me, being willing to sacrifice our convenience, our time, ourselves, our finances for the glory of God. And, and just kind of on a daily basis, again, this, this practice of considering others better than ourselves. Um, and so when Jesus talks about about carrying your cross daily. He's not necessarily talking about something that has to be heroic. But it's just his daily life of being will willing to serve others. And so this great, uh, great quote, I love it, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know, a lot of times we may think that well, we come to faith in Jesus Christ, and that's all great. And sooner or later, we learn that, uh, that there might be sacrifices we need to make. But here's what Bonhoeffer says. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Those are happy words, by the way. They are. That death, Paul teaches this in Romans 6, that death is where we recognize. I'm, I'm headed for a place of eternal separation from God. But, but Christ has opened my heart to see that if I repent and come in faith to him, my, my life becomes new through faith in him. That's, that's and, and Paul literally refers to this as a death. When we are willing to recognize our sin for what it is and confess it and come in faith to Jesus Christ, the old person dies and a new one is born. John 3. And so the willingness to give ourselves over to God 
That's a front-end deal in the life of a Christian. Recognizing sin and coming to faith in Him. And, and then that, Jesus teaches, is our continuing way we live. Every single day by faith. Every single day leaning into His grace. Every single day leaning into His help so that we can live this life authentically the way He means for us to. There you go. <laughs> well, thanks, folks. That's, that's a wrap. I don't know if any of you have any other observations or questions. All righty. Well, thank you, folks, for coming. And What's that? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been, a, been fun to go on this journey with you. Appreciate your sacrifice coming out each night. Well, thank you. Sure. <laughs>